G'day. Apparently that's how Australians speak. Um, apparently there's not supposed to be social workers at um, SMAC and I'm lucky to have snuck in again this year. But even worse than that, there's going to be God at SMAC. And I apologise to Scott because I was summoning the gods and I think it was messing with your technology. So I need to take some responsibility for that. Um, I'm certainly sitting over there summoning the gods saying, please don't let me forget my talk and please make me look by some miracle sort of hot up here today and maybe a little thin. Thank you to the blind people in the audience. Um, when I'm talking about religion and God, I'm going to refer to God, but I'm really referring to any spiritual higher being. Um, and I just feel more comfortable to say God than anything else, so you'll just have to excuse me with that. So you people are exceptionally amazing and far more talented than me, and I'm sitting up there not understanding three quarters of what these guys are saying, but by the way you're applauding and tweeting, I'm assuming that they were good at what they were doing. Um, but what amazes me is that you can literally cut someone open, cut open their chest and do stuff to their heart. I, I don't know, it's almost like you put on a pair of gloves and you're pre prepared to shove your hands anywhere. And I find it funny that you're mocking the vets for putting their hand into a hippo because you guys know no boundaries. Like, at least it's just the hippo's ass. Um, you will take a scalpel and you will lance something and squeeze pus and examine poo and vomit and you will start a heart and stop a heart and ECMO doesn't phase you and putting a tube down someone's lungs does not phase you. But if a patient says to you, I'm really scared and I'd like to pray, you're like, I ain't got no time for that. I ran from that room. I didn't grab my stethoscope or nothing. I ran from that room. That's like, seriously? You know, I don't do porn, but I don't run away if someone says, this is what, you know, if someone beside me on the plane's watching something dirty. I don't knit, but I don't freak out if someone on the bus pulls out some knitting needles. It's just prayer, people. And I think, you know, we've moved so far as a society where churches were everything and communities were everything. And I'm doing a PhD in staff well-being, and what's become really evident to me is people's, people's church community was a place of real support. And now lots of people use work as their community. And that has huge benefits and huge risks. Because when work is good and it's fun, people are well supported and they feel like the hood is a safe place to be. But when work is tough and when work is difficult, then life is difficult because people have disconnected from their community. And so when we have a friend in crisis, we'll often be like, they're like, you know, I'm drinking two bottles of bourbon a night. And we're like, yeah, that's sort of cool. That's all right. You'll be fine. And then they're like, you know, I'm snorting a bit of Coke because I'm not doing so well. And we're like, yeah, at least you'll be thin. That's all right. <laughs> There. Okay. And they're like, you know, I'm really yeah. not coping. I think my wife and I are breaking up, so I'm going to start running a marathon. It's like, yeah, at least you'll be really fit and you'll be fast. But if people say, you know, I, I think I'm going to head back to church, we're like, yeah, I'm sorry, dude, we're out. Can't cope with that whatsoever. And so I'm not a particularly religious pe person. Um, and to quote Nick Cave for all the Australians out there, I don't believe in an interventionist God. But there are times when faith is not that frightening, when we need to incorporate it and see it as actually a real resource for how we're going to work with individuals who are in crisis. But so I heard someone say yesterday, you know, if someone asks, Doctor, do you want to pray? They say, we'll get a priest for you. So are religious people the only people qualified to talk about God? I mean, spirituality and a belief in faith has been around since the beginning of humankind. There is no time in the history of mankind that we don't have some sort of spiritual gods going on. And so any of us 
have the opportunity to talk to people about their faith because it's really just about humanity. They're just wanting to connect and to connect with us. And if we want them to, if we want to know what their goals are, if we want our communication to be effective, if we probably even want to get out of there quickly, connecting with them and talking to them about their faith is nothing much. We all have the potential to do that. I perhaps am a little bit more qualified than the average person because I haven't excelled at many things in my life because I'm genetically disadvantaged, I have red hair, but no one in my whole life has ever out catholic me, <laughs> ever. Like my parents are the greatest Catholics alive. Like while other people went on car trips and put an ABBA tape on, my parents played the rosary. I'm not joking. All right, so most of us have, if you've had any sort of faith or any sort of religious belief or any, been raised in any sort of way, most of us have what I would call cough, which is crisis-orientated faith. We don't think about a higher being, we don't think about a God, we don't think about spirituality until it all goes bad. Then everyone, like people who don't believe, complete atheists, and may I just say, it needs to be said, you do heal, Jesus healed, but you're not God. And for those of you who are atheists, there's a great saying that says, you know, I used to believe I was an atheist till I realized I was God. And I think like Cliff is saying, you know, you can't bring your arrogance into the recess room. We can't bring our arrogance anywhere because we will disconnect from the people that we want to connect with. And so, Crisis oriented faith is really about at that time when things are going pear shaped, everyone goes, oh Jesus Christ, oh God, you know, like please don't let this happen to me. Please, you know, like I know I haven't been in touch for a while, but I've been doing some good things down here. I hope you've been kind of noticing that. I'm hoping that, you know, you might just see if I do this or we try to negotiate with a higher being. That's what the bargaining is with, you know, in the five stages of grief, it's where we're gone. If you will just do this for me, I will uh, donate to 80 starving people in Africa and I'll never swear again. We're trying to get somewhere with a higher being that we're not even sure exists. And the thing is, is that it's really easy to judge and say, you know, I would never be that person. I would never do that. But I think of the times when I've prayed the hardest in my life and three of the four, I've been in a hospital situation within 30 minutes. That's because when people are desperate, they want hope. And in some ways, faith and hope are quite synonymous with each other. So I'm sorry if this is a little graphic, but for any woman who has ever sat on the toilet at 10 weeks and wiped and found blood, you often go, oh God, please, not now. And lots of people will pray all the way in, even if prayer has not been a part of their life. The first time my son had anaphylaxis and within three minutes didn't even have an air canal, never known an airway, I prayed all the way in. And I don't believe that God is an interventionist, but I didn't want to be by myself. I didn't want to feel alone in the back of, of that ambulance. You know, I'm an extrovert. I don't go to the movies by myself. I don't really want to work around the universe thinking I'm totally alone. I thought that would be funnier than it was. <laughs> okay. So when did religion actually become a bad word? And I think, you know, I don't know if it's for the same for in the States, but in Australia, it kind of feels like uh, religion, people have got a faith now. It's like, you know, psst, you want to buy a watch? It's now like, yeah, I'm like, I go to church, I do religious stuff. Um, and I think it's because now when people think about religion, we think about you know, all the abuse that's gone on and that's a very shameful thing. We think that you know, religion is so conservative, it's anti-intellectual. Well, let me say this to you, Ronald McDonald as in the clown from the, and I use this as an oxymoron, restaurant McDonald's, um, <laughs> is now the most recognizable face in the world. More than Jesus Christ, more than Santa Claus, children remember and know and can identify Ronald McDonald. I'm not sure that that means we've got smarter as a society. You know, it's synonymous with war, terrorism, prejudice, and politics. 
And if we go back in time for any of those founders of those religion, I'm pretty sure they were, that was not the fundamentals of where they were coming from. I mean, Jesus hung out a lot with 12 blokes and a prostitute, which sounds like a dirty joke, just saying. Okay, so the reason that critical care doctors really shouldn't challenge religion is like, I'm gonna put it out to you, like hedge your bets. When you take gold lotto, you don't really think you're gonna win, but you're hedging your bets. It's very unlikely in a storm you're gonna hit, be hit by lightning, but you don't hold up a metal rod. So just in case there is a God, be careful about mocking them because they talk about a thing called hell and it's fire and it burns. That sounds a little scary, like plagues of locusts, things that gods do just, you know, for those of you who believe in resuscitation, you could come back as something like a mosquito or worse, an orthopedic surgeon. We know that when you look at the palliative care and end of life um, literature, that the number one that is still missing, the thing that people are asking you to connect with most is faith and spirituality and an ability to say to you, I know I'm gonna die, where do you think I'm gonna go? We also know that people of faith, when they have had that connectedness, are less likely to engage in futile care and to feel more peaceful at a time of death. So even if you have no religious belief, why would you not want that for an individual and their family when they're dying? The other thing is, is that throughout this whole SMAC course, people are talking about communication, connecting, being aware of people's goals. If we ignore people's faith and religious beliefs, we are potentially rupturing a therapeutic alliance that we can use to our own resource down the track. We can't be foolish about this. Healthcare decisions are not made mechanically. We now know from the neuroscience that people constantly mistake emotions for information and fact. So people are gonna be much more guided by God than they are gonna be guided by you, even though you're standing right in front of them. And Mark Hayden says, faith can be a valuable crutch for people in hardship and during a crisis, it's the wrong time to kick it away. And I think we can all take something from that. The other thing is, is that it makes me laugh when people say, I don't need a faith, I'm not into like organized getting together and doing things, when in actual fact, that's what people do all the time. How many people here in the audience are like, I would die without my morning coffee. I worship wine. You know, lots of you, right? So we have taken what used to fundamentally be a higher being and worshiping that. We've just filled it in with other things like bicycles. <laughs> like how many men now love to dress up in their lycra and off they go and women and they finish it all with this whole, they have this habitual thing. Like they may not be making signs of the cross and kneeling and standing and singing, but they have a very strong order of things about how it goes and then they always finish at the same coffee shop. You know, I love Pilates, it just puts me in the zone. We've just swapped one thing for another. You know, the way I think that smack, you know, if Roger Harris and those guys wanted to start a cult, I think that this place could be quite evangelistic. You know, I know that there are a number of women in the audience that if Cliff said, you know, in April every year, if you fast for four days, I'll let you wash my feet, you would sign up. <laughs> yeah, I know what's going on. So there's a great paper written last year by a woman called Cooper and in it says, divine intervention or a miracle may ultimately become the ultimate treatment option when all else fails. You know, there are very few atheists in the trenches apparently. And so um, I'm gonna give you something. So you know that it's much easier to remember things if you sing it, so you know that song, amen, amen. Take me to the church, I'm working on. Well, if you remember that really good dancing and singing, 
Here's a little amen theory. So the next time someone asks you to pray or to talk about a higher being and you crap your pants, you can just go, amen, take me to the church. Okay, so the A stands for affirm. Affirm that you are also hopeful because more and more we are finding that people say, I don't care what you say. I don't care that you tell me that your child's gonna die because Jesus is on their way. And we all wait. The crickets are in the background. He usually doesn't show. And that's not helpful for families. But what is helpful is to say, we also hope that you get a miracle. We also hope that your child lives. There is nothing smug about being right about someone's loved one still dying. Nothing smug. So we often say things like, I really hope you get that miracle too. No, you know, like, we will celebrate with you if you get that miracle. But what if God's here in a different way? What are the things that we can still do that will mean that while you still might be sad, you have no regrets? We can all do that. The M stands for meeting families worth where they're at. And I guess in pediatrics, we have a little bit more layway, but we had a family recently who just refused to believe that their child was going to die, refused to talk about withdrawal or palliation. And so for a number of weeks, we let them put honey and lemon and wrap them in leaves and come in and try this traditional medicine and that traditional medicine in the hope that their child be cured. And that child still did die after four and a half weeks, but we never went to court, we never went to ethics, and the family know that everything possible was explored. And we worked very hard with their pastor to help them get to a stage where they felt that they had given God the opportunity and that they could accept that maybe God was working with them in a way that they perhaps didn't understand. The E stands for educate. You don't move from your professional opinion. You don't say, yeah, you're right. Well, you know, we're gonna leave this up to God and just see how it goes. You maintain, look, we believe this injury is so severe, it is not maintainable. You can still show the scans. You can still give the facts and the science. You don't fight against God. You work with them. And the N is no matter what, no matter what happens, no matter if you get your miracle, you don't get your miracle, we won't abandon you. We will remain extremely committed to you and what it is that you need. And I guess for me, um, as a really young social worker in 1996, this was brought home to me by um, a really young family who lived in a rural part of Australia who I had to recontact in order to talk about this with you today. And his dad said to me, the only condition for me to be able to share this story with you is that I must use their real names. So I do have consent for that. So in 1995, I met a little boy by the name of Nathan who had a brain tumor. At his parents, who weren't particularly spiritual or religious people, they were actually real salt of the earth Australians, really lovely individuals who didn't want to know us and didn't want to be in our hospital. But unfortunately, their son had a brain tumor. And I won't talk about all the medical details, but inevitably he was palliated and their wish was to take him home. And he was about five and a half years old at the time and they really struggled about how to make sense and how to prepare this little boy as he was losing function for the fact that he was going to die. And his very precious and clever mother, um, he really loved Thomas the Tank Engine, which I'm not sure if Americans are overly familiar with Thomas, but he really loved Thomas. So his mum said to him, Jesus will come for you on Thomas the Tank Engine. And when he comes, you, you have your bags packed and you'll be ready to go. And the little boy really adopted this whole story and he kept saying, you know, Jesus is coming really soon. Have I got everything that I need to have? They went to the local railway station because he had gone blind by this stage so that he could hear the whistles and he would know which train to catch. And he, he spoke about it often about how he wasn't frightened because Jesus had told him there was gonna be lots of kids on the train and that he wouldn't be sick anymore and he was gonna be okay. And everyone really adopted that story. And when he eventually really reached the end hours of his life um, and started chain stoke breathing, um, they called the pediatrician and the local nurses and they came in and started to um, administer medication to allow him to die very peacefully. 
Now, he had a godfather who had been a, quite a good footballer and had stopped playing and had put on quite a bit of weight. And they used to call him the Fat Fox. And the Fat Fox lived in Brisbane. And it was about, in those days, about a 14-hour flight to Mount Isa. And really, he was only coming to do the eulogy because everyone was very sure that Nathan would die rather quickly once he started to be admitted opioids. Anyway, so they started to give him medication. And his, you know, the doctor said, this won't take long and he just kept chain stoke breathing. And the doctor gave more medication and he just kept chain stoke breathing. And he'd been unconscious for several days leading up to this. So this was quite a surprise. So the pediatrician rang down to Brisbane and got some advice and he just kept chain stoke breathing. And it didn't matter what they gave him, his little heart just kept on going. And his grandmother said, maybe he's confused that the fat fox is the fat controller and he's waiting until the fat controller arrives. And they all had a little laugh about this. Um, but hour after hour went on until it actually became fairly distressing for everybody. Sure enough, his godfather arrived. He came running up the stairs and as he got to the door, Nathan, who hadn't spoken, done anything for days on end, got this big beaming smile on his face and waved in his bed and died. And for everyone who was in the room, they spoke of this huge presence and this sense of peace that they really all felt like Nathan had got onto the Thomas the Tank Engine and he had caught that train with children and he had gone to a better place. And that led me to believe that it doesn't take much to have a story for people that makes sense and meaning for them. And for any of you who are worried about that, all you have to do is work in pediatrics and have child after child say all these really meaningful, important things about life that they get as children that as skeptical adults, we don't get. And so I guess in closing, what I would like to say to you is the words of the great Dalai Lama, which says, this is my simple religion. There is no need for temples, no need for complicated philosophy, philosophy. Our own brain, our own heart is our temple. The philosophy is kindness and each and every one of us has that ability to connect with every individual and to give them that sense of hope and connection when they need it most. Thank you. All right, thanks That's so amazing. much. Make sure you read that talk online. <laughs> and we're going to take a couple questions from Lauren. First of all, everyone I think is feeling a lot of social worker love, so we were appreciative <laughs> to have you here, and Twitter is blowing up with that. Um, a lot of conversations about when patient preferences or their faith conflicts with us and our belief and what we think is medically right for the patient, how to overcome that because we tend to be extremely strong-willed, um, both with our personal values and then what we want for the patient. So I think there's often a way that we can work with people's faith rather than work against it. And I think that, you know, it, I think for a lot of people, their faith is actually a hope and it's actually a goal and a connection. And I, I do believe that often people really think that there's gonna be a divine intervention and there will be a miracle. And every now and then again, we see stuff in medicine that we can't explain scientifically. Um, whether that's a miracle or not, I have no idea, but we need to stay open to where that individual's at. But rather than fight against it, I think we need to always say, we're really open, like follow that amen, we're really, you know, we're hearing that you're waiting for a miracle, we're hoping for that for you, but at the same time, we'd like to give you some pain relief or we'd like you, you know, to maybe sit with your family member in case they don't survive or we're recommending that this is what you use. And, you know, sometimes, I know when I was even having my second child, you know, I was so convinced I was going to have this peaceful vaginal delivery. You can all visualize that if you like. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd already had a cesarean and um, after 43 hours, my obstetrician's going, this kid's just not going to come out of, it's, it's not coming out of your JJ, my love. You need to go and have a Caesar. <laughs> and if you meet my son, Aiden, who's 11, he still can't find his way out of anything. So it's not surprising. <laughs> I say that to him all the time. What hole? What hole? Um, <laughs> But I couldn't let go of the hope and I'm really grateful that he kept saying to me right until the 11, you know, 43rd hour, 
that that was an option and he never was mean to me about it. He didn't say, I told you so, you dummy. He said, you know, you've tried really hard and this is where it's got to. And so I think we can, we can work with faith rather than work against it. We need to know what we know scientifically and we need to hear the desperation and the hope from them and, and really connect with that. Because I think when people feel heard and to feel like everything is still on the table, then all options are open. Did he really say the JJ? No, the JJ would be my word. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then one other question is, when we do have these differences or we're really frustrated because a patient or their family may not share our uh, mental mindset, how do you do that with, or support them without seeming insincere? Um, you know, try and connect with your own powerlessness. I was saying that in communication course yesterday. I think all of us at one point or another every year should put on plastic underpants and a gown that's open in the back with no bra and walk around and feel how powerless these people are. Like we, it doesn't matter how educated they are, how wealthy they are, how poor they are. When they are in front of us in our ED or in our outpatient clinics or in intensive care, they are 100% powerless. <laughs> and so when we give them power to say, we've heard you, we're listening, you know, like, you can be very sincere about that. You may not believe for one second their religious you know, beliefs or their religious connection, but you can believe in them. You can believe that their faith is important. You can believe that they believe that it's true. And I think, you know, any point where you make a real effort to connect with an individual, they will experience that and you'll be surprised how it will open things up. And then there are sometimes religious wankers and you can just write them off. 